Okay, guys, it's time you learn about the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, in a nutshell, is when we went from making things by hand to making things by machine. And right now, what we need to focus in on is how this Industrial Revolution got started. And to help us remember, we're going to use this guy right here. Oh yes, we need a unicorn. Don't understand? Don't worry, you soon will. So the Industrial Revolution begins in England at about 1750 and goes for about 100 years. And there's a few reasons why it begins in England, and we're going to go through each one. The first thing you need to know is before you can industrialize, you've got to have surplus food. If you remember in the Middle Ages, people used the three-field system to keep the land fertile. That's where you grow food on two of the fields, and you have to leave the third field alone. That gives it a chance to rest and get its nutrients back. And then the, so the following year, the field you left alone, that can grow on, and one of the other fields would rest, and so on and so forth. Anyway, that was, you know, it worked out okay, but the problem is, by definition, you're only using two-thirds of the land. One-third of the land just sits there doing nothing. Here, one-third of the land just sat there doing nothing. And you can see on the bottom left, it's, you know, they would use it for grazing land. So this is area where the animals could run, and, of course, their poop would help make the land fertile again, right? And this area was known, um, they had this open kind of common pasture area. So for the poor farmers, this really worked out well for them because if they didn't have enough land to, and they couldn't produce enough food on the, on the land that they were assigned, they had that common pasture area to, to grow a little extra food for themselves. And this system worked for a while. But then there was a change in the law. And England created the enclosure law. And the enclosure law literally means to close off the land. They started fencing it in. The common land is gone. That grazing land, gone. So if you're a tiny farmer with a small plot of land, you're really up the creek at this point because you're not going to be able to use your land and, and be able to keep it fertile and have space to, you know, graze your animals. It, it just, it really hurt the, the farmers. And so what you end up having is the rich landowners kicking off the other, the people who had worked on their land um, and what they found was that it was more, they ended up making more money either running one large farm or shutting down the farming and using the, the whole area for grazing. So the, the wealthy farmers got larger, bigger farms, and a lot of the small farmers got kicked off the land. And what happens is, is these larger plots end up becoming more productive. And this is what we call the agricultural revolution. And this is the second food revolution. The first food revolution was the Neolithic revolution. That's where people learned to farm in the first place. But this agricultural revolution is where suddenly, instead of just using one third of the land, people can use all the land all the time. And if you see this picture on the right, you see this four year rotation what happens is what they learned was that certain plants take certain nutrients out of the soil and other plants put that nutrients back in. What does that mean? Well, nothing because you guys all live in the city. But here's the deal. You end up being able to use all the land all the time. You're producing more food. In addition, not only are you able to grow food in, in you know, more food on the land, but you also have new technologies like the seed drill. And now think about it. On a tiny farm, it's not going to make sense to invest all your money and buy something like a seed drill. It's ridiculous. You, it, it's not going to be cost effective. It's easier to just plant it yourself. But if you've got a very, very large, huge farm, suddenly investing in technology like this makes a lot of sense. So again, this is another way where the farms suddenly become more productive and more efficient, producing more food. And when you have more food, you have more people. Suddenly, the population is going to grow. The only issue is, now all these farmers, where are they going to end up? They don't have jobs in the country. So guess where they move? 
Ah, that brings us to reason number two, workers. All these poor farmers end up moving to the cities, desperate for work. And they came by the boatload. Check out these numbers. In Manchester alone, you go from 35,000 people, and 40 years later, there's 353,000. Now let me tell you something. You don't get that many people just by people having babies. That's got to be people moving in. Same thing with Leeds. That goes over 100,000. Birmingham is more than 100,000 more people. Same thing with Sheffield. All right. So these cities get packed with people. And we're going to talk about what their lifestyle was like being shoved into cities over a very short period of time in a future lesson. So the name for this, when the population starts moving from the rural areas, which is another way of saying the countryside, and instead they, a lot of your people start moving to the cities, otherwise known as the urban areas, that process is known as urbanization. All right, that brings us to reason number three, the inventions. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we already talked a little bit about the seed drill, but there were other things that came out, like the steam engine, the Bessemer process, which could be used to make steel, and of course, the uh, textile mills. And what's interesting about England is it was a place that embraced science. It, the scientific revolution had come out many years before. England was a place with a lot of universities, a lot of educated people. So these new technologies start hitting fast and furious, and lo and behold, new industries are created. Raw materials. England's geography really lent itself to industrialization. First off, because it had lots of rivers. Now, of course, rivers can be a great source of transportation, and we'll get into that later. But another thing you may not realize is that rivers can be a source of fuel, namely because they power water wheels like what you're looking at right now. And in fact, the water wheel was the main power source for many of the machines early on in the Industrial Revolution. Of course, later in the revolution, during the Industrial Revolution, there comes out to uh, a new invention is created, which is right in front of you. That's the steam engine. Now, the trick with getting a steam engine to work is you got to build a fire. And if you're going to use wood, eh, that can get tricky, especially if you're an island nation like England. Eventually, it's just going to run out of forests. And if you cut down a hundred year old tree, it's not like you can snap your fingers and get another one. But luckily for England, that's not an issue because it's got lots and lots of coal. And not only do they have coal, but they also have iron ore. And those two raw materials are key for industrialization. If you take a look at this map, all those dark gray spots, those are the coal fields. And the white squares, that's where the iron ore is found. Put those two together and you've got factories blooming like crazy. That's why all the little circles and those black triangles, those are some of the biggest cities in England. And they're going to be crowded with workers looking for new jobs. Oh, and the other big reason they had a ton of raw materials is because they had colonies. If you remember, mercantilism, remember, the mercantilism is where the mother country gets all the money because... It controls the manufacturing process, right? Remember that triangle trade stuff? That the colonies in the Americas were forced to send their raw materials to, the, to its European colonial powers dirt cheap. And England is able to take the raw materials from its colonies, right, and convert those and use those raw materials in its factories to produce more manufactured goods. And you see this here about cash crops. That's an important idea. What happens is, is you start this phenomena where in the colonies you have to grow certain items specifically for sale. It is a crop, it is an agricultural thing that is grown only for sale. And that's a new thing. Before this colonization, before you had to worry about mercantilism, people would be able to grow and focus on growing those things that they could either eat or use themselves. But now people are being forced to grow specific foods just so it can be sold. And what ends up being one of the side effects 
is very often famine. That, you know, you may be growing cotton for export, but, you know, if the weather turns bad, you can't eat the cotton. That's the problem. Money. You can't have, remember all those big machines, the steam engines, those big textile mills? Well, they don't come cheap. But luckily for England, it had experienced the commercial revolution. Now, you should have learned about this in ninth grade. This was that era. Um, it basically takes off around the time of the age of exploration. That as businessmen start to invest in overseas voyages, they have to set up things like an insurance company, stock markets, joint stock companies, all of that. And that was great for exploration. But now those same tools, those promissory notes, those, uh, the, you know, the, uh, all these financial instruments, instead of just using it for exploration or some of the other things, these tools are now going to be used by businessmen who want to invest in creating new businesses. Transportation. Remember those rivers I talked about? They come in super handy when you want to ship goods in, throughout England. And as you can see in the picture in the top right, that's an example where they would just take things by barge up and throughout England because there were so many rivers. In addition, to the left, if you didn't remember, England is an island. So now it's got ocean access, which again makes it really handy when you want to start shipping all those manufactured goods here and there. And as you can see in the bottom right, later they are going to start to develop the railroad. And that again, railroad lines are going to run throughout England, making it easier to ship your raw materials to the factories and ship the manufactured goods out of the factories so that they can be sold at the market. Political stability. This is another thing that's really interesting. Out of the entire world, I mean, we just got done, it wasn't too long ago that we were talking about the French Revolution and all the craziness, right? But here in England, tiny little England, basically since, you know, the glorious revolution in 1689 when William and Mary had signed the English Bill of Rights, things had pretty much mellowed out in England. It was a very stable, steady government. So it was a, it was a nice place to do business. You didn't have to worry about a revolutionary or a brand new government taking place or the laws changing. Everything was stable. So, it was a, so again, it was, a, it was a perfect location for people to settle down and do their business. Okay, so we're all done. Oh no, I forgot about our, I mean our friend with the horn forgot about the unicorn. Oh yeah, you know, I think pretty unicorns are really cool. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. I, I think pretty unicorns are really cool. This is the sentence you should know. See, it's a mnemonic, and this mnemonic is going to help you remember all the reasons why the Industrial Revolution started in England. See, I stands for inventions. Remember the seed drill and the, the textile mill and the steam engine? All of that, right? The T, well, that was that whole transportation thing. The fact that England had rivers, the fact that it has ocean access because it's an island, and the fact that it starts building railroads. The P, well, that was for political stability. Now, the fact that it had a stable government for many years since the Glorious Revolution. Urbanization, that was that whole process where the displaced workers who used to be farmers ended up moving to the cities in very large numbers looking for work. That's one of the key things that helped England industrialize, having this huge mass of workers available. The A, well, that was the agricultural revolution. Don't forget, with all of these rural workers moving to the cities, it's not going to work. I mean, you guys live in the cities. How many of you guys have a farm that you eat all your food from? No way. All of these people in the city have to be fed. So you have to make sure that the few that you even though you have fewer agricultural workers, those workers can produce enough food to feed all of this large number, the large percentage of your population that suddenly lives in the city. All right, the R, that's raw materials. And the big raw materials that England has is iron ore, the iron ore, and the coal. And finally, C, that's the commercial revolution. 
all that financial strength, all those banks and financial institutions set up so that made it easier for people to invest in new businesses. All right, now that really is it. Uh, good luck and I will see you in class tomorrow.